Over the past few weeks, my son and I have watched the Lord of the Rings trilogy movies, and I've been struck once again by the number of parallels with J.R.R. Tolkien's world and the Christian life. In addition to expressions of the heavenly kingdom, the battle between what is good and what is not of the good, the characters with flaws who are able to overcome them through the help of community, there is a profound understanding of suffering. You might remember that Tolkien himself was, uh, he witnessed incredible suffering during World War I when he served in the British Army. The main storyline of The Lord of the Rings is that one person must carry the weight of evil. He must endure incredible suffering over a long journey to destroy the source of evil and death in order to save the world. As Christians, that should sound pretty familiar when we think about Jesus. Well, suffering itself is a major theme in this letter, 1 Peter, that we hear today. The word suffering itself is mentioned 12 times in this short letter. The intentional repetition of the word makes it clear to us that as we read today, that the target audience was experiencing an intensely difficult time. The letter reminds them that they do not suffer alone, hearing words like, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. Certainly during this time of this current pandemic, this passage from 1 Peter couldn't be any more appropriate. So many people in the world are indeed suffering. Hopefully, in hearing and reflecting upon this letter, we will be reminded and then in turn remind others that we are all united in our suffering. We never suffer alone. In the St. Michael Word for Thought email just yesterday, we received a quote from Brother David Vryhoff of the Society of St. John the Evangelist. He says, God will use even the tragedies and sufferings of our lives to wake us up, to turn us towards the new life, to help us see ourselves and the world we inhabit differently. Amen, Brother David. Thank you for these words. I do want to make sure that we understand that suffering itself is not inevitable. Although it is universal, Suffering is not a necessary human experience. And what I mean by this is it's not necessary for one to suffer in order to have faith in a loving God. It's not necessary for you to suffer to be considered a faithful person. And you don't have to suffer in order to grow in your faith. And when we're talking about suffering, we need to be clear about what we mean. We're not talking about tolerating an unpleasant conversation or missing a single meal. Suffering means experiencing severe physical, psychological, or spiritual pain. And currently, we are all suffering. It happens not only in those big noticeable ways, but also in small chronic ways that impact how we view and engage the world. Many people are experiencing psychological suffering during this time of isolation. Now, suffering itself has the potential to cause great harm, but also has the potential to enable transformation. Not all suffering is meaningless. As Christian people, we understand that the suffering of our Lord happens in terms of physical pain and in the mental and spiritual anguish of separation and betrayal. We cannot separate the suffering from the work that Jesus accomplishes on the cross. You see, the crucifixion is itself a judgment of all oppressive systems in this world, and the cross overturns the accepted idea that in order for the lives of the elite to prosper, that those who are marginalized must suffer or go without. All oppressive systems of our world that subject people to suffering must be challenged and ultimately destroyed. Jesus' work on the cross, his suffering, not only makes salvation possible, it also creates a roadmap by which we help to create a more just 
and peaceful world. Because we share in Christ's death and resurrection, we should not be surprised then if we find ourselves suffering for the sake of the good news. Today in our epistle we hear, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Suffering for the sake of following Jesus is to be understood as a blessing. Listen to these additional passages from the New Testament. From James, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind. From Matthew, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all things, kinds of evil against you because of me. From Luke, blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. And from Romans, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Jesus, Paul, the author of James and 1 Peter are all convinced that followers of Jesus will face persecution, ridicule, and suffering because they follow the Lord Jesus. So I have to wonder, if we are not upsetting the oppressive forces in our world today by our faith and action, are we truly following Jesus? If we suffer for the sake of our faith in Jesus by standing up for righteousness, for fighting for justice, and pursuing peace, we remember that our Lord is with us and that we have hope and the knowledge that suffering is not forever. First Peter tells us, and after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore support, strengthen, and establish you. On the other side of suffering, there is restoration. In this letter of 1 Peter, after complimenting and encouraging the Christian community and enduring their suffering, the author offers some direction on how to live out the Christian life. Discipline, resistance, and humility help us as followers of Jesus to be faithful to the call in our life to, be peace, to live peaceably and honorably in a world that often mistreats the least of these. All three of these characteristics have great merit. And today I want to focus on humility because I believe that in our humility we can practice those spiritual disciplines and resist the oppressive powers of this world. Now humility requires us to pay attention to our own thoughts and actions. It means not always getting what we think that we want. Humility does not mean self-denigration or having a low self-regard. Rather, it's a recognition that there is something greater than ourselves. In humility, we recognize that there is a God and that we are not God. Now, this is humbling in the sense that it reminds us that ultimately, we're not in control of everything that we would like to be in control of. It reminds us that we are creatures who are absolutely dependent upon God for our existence and our salvation. This recognition also gives us hope in the face of uncertainty, in the midst of grief, and in the middle of struggle. Humility allows us to cast all our anxieties before God with trust and belief in God's promises. I think that some of us fear that if we're humble, then people might see us as weak or even as a target. Yet we followers of Jesus are called to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Now you can't get down to that place of protection and be underneath God's hand unless you humble yourself. But once you do, you can experience God's profound protection and eventually be lifted up by God. The men of St. Michael are finishing up our third book study of the year, 
And this third book, The Power of a Humble Life, addresses the keys to humility. It starts with an acknowledgement that all we are and all we have are gifts from God. And then we recognize that we would not be who we are today or where we are today without the love and support of countless other people. During this time of physical isolation, do not let the opportunity to express your gratitude, love, and support for the friends and family and others who have throughout the years to help you to become who you are today. You did not get where you are all on your own. The practice of gratitude to God and to help and to others helps to keep us grounded, to keep us humble. And one of the final moving scenes of the third movie, Return of the King, when Frodo can no longer walk for the burden of his suffering is just too great. His friend Sam picks him up and carries him. When I wrote down those words, I was reminded of that footstep in the Sands poem, when the two sets of footprints becomes one, that's Jesus carrying us. You see, no one makes it through their life on their own. We need each other to share the burdens of our suffering, and as we seek to live lives of humility, discipline, and resistance, we follow our Lord's example to abolish the oppressive forces of this world which cause suffering for so many. May we be bold in our faith in action and grateful for all the gifts and people in our lives. Let us pray. Loving God, through the example of your Son, Jesus, you have taught us how to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Help us to work against the oppressive powers that infect our world today. Help us to practice gratitude and to humbly seek shelter under your mighty hand. Amen.